All right, joining me now here on the Matthew Filipovich Show is my friend Maya Shenwar. Maya is a journalist and the executive director of Truth Out, which you can find at truth-out.org. You can also follow her on Twitter at Maya Shenwar. Maya, thank you so much for being on the show. It's great to be here. Thanks, Matt. All right, so Maya, you've written quite a lot about our broken prisons, prison system here in the United States of America. In fact, you're currently working on a book on the topic. And you recently wrote at Truth Out about how the prison system actually affects your family personally. Why don't you tell us all about it? Yeah, well, so for the, let's see, for the past seven or so years, I've been writing about prison on and off as a reporter and covering the pardon system and federal parole, prison farms, all, all kinds of different issues that were very third person. And, but beneath the surface of all of that, one of my motivations has been the fact that my family has been entangled in this system, let's see, for about six years. And my sister has been in and out of jail and prison since then. And most recently, she's been incarcerated in a state prison in Illinois for theft and um, also for violating parole on another nonviolent charge. And she went to prison in May, and she was pregnant. And this was one of those things where we kind of thought that the pregnancy would be taken into consideration during the sentencing process. And it definitely was not. So there was this kind of shock upon the sentencing that, okay, not only was she going to have to go through her entire pregnancy in prison under prison health care, separated from her family and separated from all kinds of preparation that one would normally do during pregnancy to prepare for actually having a baby. Not only that, but once she had the baby, it was very clear that she would be separated from her for the first few months of her life. So this has been kind of looming over my sister and secondarily looming over the rest of us uh, for the past few months. And when it happened, it affected me so much emotionally in a way that nothing else I've written about has and I just felt compelled to write it down first person and publish it on Truth Out. Um, and, and the story itself uh, of, of her actual, the, the birth of your niece, um, it, it, it's, 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 it's about as horrific as you think it would be. Um, just the whole entire process was, was from, from start to finish is, is, is pretty harrowing. Um, yeah. Just tell, tell, describe what actually, how the process happened, because she did, your sister didn't actually go into labor. She actually had her labor induced. Uh, describe to us what actually happened. Right. So the way it works there is that prison is on a very regimented schedule, and there's a changing of the guard at a certain time, like, that's not a myth, <laughs> and there is kind of a very set personnel schedule, and so they can't really allow for interruptions that might disrupt that schedule and change people's work lives in a way that would be, you know, interfering with union contracts. It's kind of complicated, but what it comes down to is that instead of waiting for women to go into labor, what they do is they schedule a time to induce them. And often, women don't know exactly when they've been scheduled, so they're kind of waiting in suspense to give birth, not waiting for their water to break, not waiting for contractions, but waiting for a correctional officer to come in the middle of the night and take them off to the hospital where their labor will then be induced. And so what happened to my sister was she was woken up at 4.30 in the morning. She was taken from her cell, driven to the hospital, in handcuffs, shackled until she got into bed. And they began to induce labor. And this took a really long time to work. (laughs) 
Yeah. And it, they weren't quite sure how it was going to go. So it was 26 hours of labor. She was in excruciating pain. She could not have family present, no friends, uh, no one from her personal community. It was just a guard watching over her at all times. So there were two correctional officers that came along from the prison and at all times, one of them was basically guarding her to make sure she didn't jump out of bed during labor <laughs> and run off. <laughs> as as women in labor are are wont to do, I, I've seen you Obviously. know so that happens in hospitals all the time. Just people, mm-hmm. women who are giving birth, just hop up and start running around. The common problem, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, so she's got these people. Actually, at one point, she she told me that. Uh, her least favorite of the two con- correctional officers started basically ordering room service, <laughs> like asking the nurse to bring her mozzarella sticks and snacks, and then every so often just looking over the top of her sunglasses at, at my sister to see where she was in her labor and how loud she was moaning. And so it was, yeah, like I feel like it was almost a caricature to the point of comical in terms of how abusive can you be <laughs> to a woman who's in this totally helpless position. So, yeah, so 26 hours, um, she's finally able to give birth. They did a lot of procedures on her that they would not have otherwise. They did an episiotomy, which is basically cutting you up so that the baby can come out since she was not dilated. And she wasn't ready to go into labor. Did, 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 did they did, they did that with her permission, without her permission? I mean, I, this is just this is just how they do it. They're just saying, okay, this is time. They're going to induce this labor. It's happening now because we scheduled it on this calendar. That this is this is this is the day that the child's going to going to come out. I, I mean, was that something that she had to? I mean, I guess it's sort of like I guess the kind of the question is what. I guess under when you're a prisoner, do you have any rights of of actually consenting to different types of medical procedures? How does that actually work? No, it's completely disempowering. There are no rights for the prisoner in that situation. So I'm not sure what would have happened if Keeley had come in with like a full legal argument for why she could not give birth at that time. Um, but, you know, at the time she was just really, really scared and, um, didn't, there was really no avenue for resistance because the response to any kind of resistance is just restraint and shackling handcuffs, you know, um, the point of these people who are guarding you is basically when it comes down to it, physical restraint kind of just manipulating your body to the point where, you know, this other being comes out of it and then you can be taken back to prison. And actually what I thought was interesting that she told me on the phone, she got one phone call, which I thought was symbolic in a funny way. She said after she gave birth, she got one phone call and she called me and she said, well, you know, any decision that happens to me out here is going to be worse than what would happen in prison. Like if I did something wrong or, you know, even like what kind of phone call she was able to make, how long she was supposed to be on the phone, all of that was even more restricted because now she was in the quote free world. Uh And this was the phrase that the correctional officers kept referring to it was the phrase I heard when I called the warden because after I hadn't heard from her for a long time, I was worried something horrible had happened. And I was told again and again, nothing can be done. She can't communicate with you because restrictions are higher since she's in the free world. So the idea being that since she's out of prison, there's this huge likelihood that she'll escape. Now, this is a person who stole a bottle of perfume from a drugstore. Uh-huh. <laughs> like this is, you know, um, but these are the lengths that the system is going to, 
to prevent her ostensibly from escaping, but it's it's like there's something more. It's just a larger power structure that's being protected there. So in the end, she gives birth. Um, the baby miraculously is seven pounds, five ounces, healthy, um, and she's allowed to stay with the baby for 24 hours. Now, immediately after giving birth, they shackled her to the bed. So in Illinois, it's illegal to shackle a woman to the bed during childbirth, but then they're allowed to shackle you directly following the birth. Wow. And so you would think this would be something that, well, even if I'm allowed to do that, there's no reason to do it. Um, right. So, yeah, but they just clamp those shackles right back on. And this is like, it, it's such a helpless position to be in to begin with, but add to that the problem that this woman has 24 hours to spend with her baby before she's taken back to prison and she's shackled to the bed. So it was difficult to pick up the baby. It was difficult to play with the baby, obviously. It was just basically 24 hours spent mostly looking at the baby and mm-hmm. realizing that she existed and processing the fact that this was a relationship that was about to be broken. And then my sister was led away from the baby in handcuffs and the bond was broken. And that was that. 